I'm Mary Nash, and I'm an attorney, uh, and I do estate planning. I tell people all the time, I'm an elder law attorney, but not an elder lawyer. And I like to make sure everybody has the distinction uh, between the two. Uh, the, the, what I do is, is the most interesting, wonderful area of the law. I, you hear all the jokes about lawyers and all those kind of things. They don't apply to elder lawyers. They only apply to litigators and you know criminal lawyers and all those other lawyers. They don't apply to us. Um, elder law is an area of the law in which you are doing something good for your clients every single day. When I get up every morning, I know that before the day's over, I'm going to have helped a family. And we have a book coming out uh, in about six weeks uh, that's just going to the publisher next week. It's called Helping Hands Across Time, Keeping Family Money in the Family, which is what it's about. So as I'm talking here this morning, I want each of you to think back on your own family. Think back to the great grandma and grandpa, and grandma and grandpa, and mom and dad. Now you, your children, Maybe grandchildren, not the you know, you're old enough to have grandchildren, but uh, think about the hands that have helped you, across, your family, across time. What amazes us as elder law attorneys uh, is, you know, we do good things for the family every day. Mom and Dad come in, Grandma and Grandpa come in and talk to us about uh, our family, where our money's going to go, how we're going to take care of our family in the future. And everybody wants to keep the family money in the family. Uh, I want to get his, whatever I've worked for my entire life, I want to get it to my kids and to my grandkids. Now, those of you who don't have grandkids, you won't understand this yet, but it's really get it to my grandkids. <laughs> okay, the heck with the kids. Uh, <laughs> grandkids are God's way of thanking us or rewarding us for not killing our young. Uh, I know, I have a grandson, and my whole focus, you know, is to be able to educate him, uh, to make sure that he has a good start in life. My kids already got their start. I already educated them. Okay? Nash is 15. So I'm still waiting, you know, for him to, to decide what he wants to be. Yesterday he wanted to be a policeman. Tomorrow he wants to be, you know, and we've changed uh, every year. You know, we used to be a truck driver. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this truck driver games that came out about so many years ago, and you could take a load from here to there. Well, I mean, we went through that whole thing. And he was going to be a truck driver, and we traveled all over the country in this video game, uh, driving the truck and carrying loads and dumping loads. And I, I think you learned more about geography with that game than any other one thing, how to get from point A to point B. Uh, but uh, I want to see him get a start in life. I'm looking forward to his future and to make sure that my helping hand uh, moves across his life and across uh, our family, keeping family money in the family. Uh, and the thing that probably discourages estate planning attorneys and, and elder law attorneys as much as anything is watching the children fight about what mom and dad have done. And people say to me, and we have people come in and say, uh, oh, my children, oh, my children get along perfectly. Uh, my children will never fight. Okay, that's the parents who really don't know their kids very well. Uh, <laughs> but we, when we say to them, Tell me about your children. Tell me about your children. All right? And they begin to tell me, well, this one's not in that good a marriage. And, 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 and this one doesn't manage money very well. And, uh, and I have two kids, and they don't like each other. How can my two kids not like each other? They were raised in the same house, apparently by different parents. Um, but uh, you know, they, 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 don't, uh, they just don't like each other. And so I know, okay, as an estate planning attorney, that if I left either one of them in charge of the other one's money, Okay, there would be an argument about it. Uh, my son would grow up and say, well, I don't care what you do. And my daughter would say, great, I'll take it. And, uh, and I know my children. Most of us know our children. Here's what happens when a parent dies. Okay. Along with the grief, from now on I'm an orphan, okay, I don't have a parent. Uh, along with the grief comes all the sibling rivalries back again. The oldest child still the oldest child, the middle child still the middle child, the younger child still the younger child. And so we have to be very guarded as estate planning attorneys, as elder law attorneys, when we're talking to families about your family. Tell me about your family. Don't, just don't tell me about your assets and yeah, what you've got, but tell me how you want to take care of it in the future. And so here today they've asked me to talk about guardianships uh, and um, basically conservatorships, guardianships and conservatorships and special needs trusts. We do a lot of those, a lot of guardianships. Much more guardianships today for the elderly than we do for children who are turning 18, uh, which has always amazed me. 
the law says that no matter what the problems the child has, the day they're 18, they are legally competent. And we have a saying in our office, what does an 18-year-old with money have that they've inherited right, or received in a settlement of some sort? What does an 18-year-old with money have that they don't have when they're 19? The money. <laughs> okay? And so when we talk about minor guardianships, what we're talking about is a child who may have issues as, as a, a, a minor okay, that on their 18th birthday okay, is now of majority and can make their own decisions. Right? So you have a child who's had issues all through their lives for whatever uh, reason, and I have a, an adopted grandson. If, if I only got one grandkid. Out of my two kids, I thought I'd get 10 grandchildren. Uh, having been an only child myself, I only had a whole family, you know, a whole, whole flock of grandchildren. And I got one. And so uh, I said to my son one time, when are you going to have kids? When are you going to get married and have kids? And he said, Mom, if you want more grandkids, I suggest you adopt them. So I took him in his word, and I've adopted nine of them, uh, one of which is my own biological grandson. Uh, and so, you know, I do things with all those grandkids who don't have grandmothers. Uh, and one of them said to me one time when I said, do you have a grandmother? And he said, no. And I said, would you like to have one? And he said, yes. I said, well, I'll be your grandmother. He said, do you know what grandmothers are for? And I said, no. And he said, they're to buy you things and take you places. Mm -hmm. So I buy them things and take them places, <laughs> OK? But I have one right now uh, who will be 16 in October, next October, who is in a rehab center in Minneapolis. Uh, I had him when he was 9 and 10. He spent summers with us when he was 9 and 10. Uh, and then uh, we didn't have much contact with him through the years. And when he was 10 years old, uh, he told me, you know, I've had 10 daddies. Uh, and so I've heard along the line, kind of kept up with him, uh, you know, through telephone calls and those kind of things. And last I heard, he had had 15 daddies. That's a new daddy each year uh, for him. And no wonder he has problems. Uh, and he's in a rehab center in Minneapolis. I'm going to go see him uh, in a couple of weekends. And, and his issues are anger issues. Uh, he's so angry about everything. Uh, and this daddy a couple of times ago had him shoot his dog because his dog was barking. The hardest thing he said he'd ever done in his life. And, um, and he's talking to me about these things. And he said, I just get so angry. Uh, and the school wouldn't let him come back after this last issue because of what? They're afraid of his anger exploding and he shoots somebody. I'm afraid of that for him too. But on his 18th birthday, this kid loses all of his parental instruction and control. <coughs> so if he's had any, I might add that part, okay? Uh, he's, a, he's a majority. He can do as he pleases. He can live on his own, okay? And if he has money coming to him, it's his money. Mom and dad lose control of that. You know, that always kind of shocks us when uh, you think, well, wait a minute, that's not your money. That's, that's, I've taken care of it your whole life. You can't control money. You can't manage money. I'm up. I'm 18. So I've reached my majority. So what do we do? Okay, before 18, okay, before 18, we file for a guardianship. And so we're looking to the court to say, hey, there are reasons why this child should not manage their own money. And, and what we do is we go to the medical people who've been taking care of them, and we say to them, uh, please give me something in writing that tells the court that you, this kind of person needs some continued management, some continued financial management. Uh, and the court almost always, with that kind of letter, uh, will give us a conservatorship. Conservatorship, let me, let me give you the two different uh, meanings here. Uh, I've given you the chapter out of our new book, which is the unedited chapter, uh, that you can read. It isn't com that one was not completely finished. Uh, but um, uh, it'll give you some ideas about guardianships, not only for young people, but guardianships for the elderly. And so it, when you're reading through it, it divides between the two, and this is written for us, this is written across the United States, it's not just Arkansas specific, but there are two things. Guardianship is of the person, okay, to make decisions for the person, where they're going to live, uh, you know, who's going to take care of them, uh, those kinds of the issues. The person, think person, okay, I'm going to take care of the person, okay. On the other side is conservatorship, I want to take care of their money, or their estate, okay, so there, there can be two different things. Or they can be the same thing. Uh, we have an elderly woman in Hebrew Springs not long ago uh, who has uh, a considerable wealth. And her daughter was taking care of her physically at home. Uh, she was not doing well. Dementia had kind of set in to where she wasn't quite sure how to manage her own affairs. Uh, and the daughters came to me and said, we need to do something about mom. 
I'm taking care of our caregivers coming in every single day. I'm paying them out of her estate. Uh, we need to do something. And I'd like to get a conservatorship. Uh, and I said, well, you know, we can do that with an irrevocable trust. You can be the trustee. You can manage mom's money in a trust. Right? And at the same time, uh, then, you know, we can get the court to give you the management of her person. Uh, well, what's the first thing that happens? I don't care what the Bible says. You know what the number one sin is? Greed. Okay? <laughs> Here's what happens. There are three kids, one of whom is an alcoholic, uh, but there's a brother who's the oldest child, uh, and he says, wait a minute. Why is my baby sister running mom's affairs? Could it be that he'd only visited his mom three times in the last year and a half? Okay, that might have something to do with it. Uh, but uh, that's my baby sister. She doesn't know anything about anything. She doesn't know how to manage money. She doesn't know how, okay. Now the fact she'd been taking care of her mother on an almost daily basis with the caregivers for a year and a half was insignificant. He immediately filed for a guardianship with an attorney, okay, and we went to court and the attorney said, he wants to manage mom's money and I said, I think mom doesn't have any money. What? Mom doesn't have any money. What do you mean mom doesn't have any money? Mom is a wealthy woman. Well, she put all of her money in an irrevocable trust, and her daughter is the trustee. Well, okay, well then, then what? Well, you can, have the, you can have the guardianship of mom's person. <laughs> well, I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> Which gave us a hand as to what he was really after. But the court said, well, wait a minute. There's already an irrevocable trust. It's already been established for her care. Okay? So we're going to go ahead and give you the guardianship. And all of a sudden, now the sister says, I've stepped aside. Take care of mom. I'll, I'll pay because she has the money. She's in charge of the money. I'll pay. But now you're in charge of the caregivers and those late night uh, you know, hours when the caregiver doesn't show up and sister has to show up. Uh, you know, It's all up to you now. And so we run into that fairly often. But you see the difference? One's a guardianship, I'm going to take care of mom's person, okay? And the other one is the conservatorship, I'm taking care of mom's money. And the court could have said, had we not had the irrevocable trust in place, the court could have said, here, you take care of mom and her person, and you take care of her money. <coughs> or you could put the two together, and one person can do it. Right? We have a, a, a case in our office that we just resolved a few months ago. Grandpa and daughter, a granddaughter, are driving down the road. A guy runs out with a bicycle, kind of turns in front of him. Grandpa swerves to miss it, hit a culvert, kind of straight on. Okay, and the little girl has uh, brain damage. And so we had a very large settlement from that, and uh, and when we got ready to put it into uh, the uh, special needs trust. Uh, we had to look at some issues. Okay, and I'm going to talk a few minutes about the different kinds of special needs trusts: third party settled and self settled uh, trust. Uh, and we were looking at the issue of this being the little girl's money because it was her damages that we were being paid for. Uh, and so if, if that were the case, and she was going to need a, a tremendous amount of help for the rest of her life, okay, now this is, you know, uh, she's going to have a round the clock care. Uh, and so we're looking at, she's, we've got her on SSI, we've got her on Medicaid, we've got her on SSDI, we've got her on Medicare. So we've got her covered medically, and the medical bills are humongous. Okay? and are going to continue to be that way. So if, if we're going to have this settlement that will do everything else for her, okay? uh, you know, all the things that she can do, all the therapy that she can have that Medicaid and Medicare won't pay for, uh, we've got this money, how do we do it? We go to the court and say, uh, Your Honor, set up a conservatorship. Okay? Make her mother the conservator, the person who will manage for her. And we get the court to order it, okay? She doesn't have to, at the end of, of her life, the child's life, pay back uh, the government and it's, uh, what it's provided to her. So those benefits are out there. You just have to know what they are. And, and the one thing about being an elder law attorney working in this area all the time, this is all I know. Okay, Don't come to me and ask me to do your uh, divorce unless you want to stay married. Uh, you know, uh, don't, don't come to me for a criminal case unless you probably want to spend some time uh, you know, as a guest of the county, <laughs> whatever. Uh, we have someone in our office who does that kind of work. I don't do that kind of work. Uh, I do this kind of work, and I do it all the time for people, you know, all over uh, the country, really, because I'm, I'm licensed in four states. So when we talk about 
guardianships and conservatorships. If you have a child who's nearing the age of 18 and you're concerned about <coughs> they're, they're being loose in the world, okay, on their own, you want to talk to an attorney who does this kind of work all the time about filing for a guardianship. And if this child is receiving money, okay, with his SSI or SSDI, whatever it is, Social Security Disability Insurance, uh, you want to say, Your Honor, you know, I, maybe all I need is just to be the guardian of my child ongoing, okay? Uh, so I can help them avoid some of the mistakes that, that, that the world might push on them. Or you might say to the court, no, Your Honor, I want to be not only the guardian, but I want to be the conservator as well, okay? So make me both of those. And you get to decide, because some of our clients, you know, get $600 a month, they say, oh, gee, you know, the kid, they can have that. <laughs> they don't need a conservator for that. And there's not a settlement of any kind coming, so I don't have to worry about it. All I'm looking for uh, is to make decisions for my child, to make sure my child isn't married uh, to someone who's going to take advantage of them, uh, that I can make sure my child is living in a good place where I'm not worried about uh, their safety. So if I'm the guardian, I get to make all those decisions. If I'm the conservator, I get to make the decisions financially. Okay, So everybody understands the difference between uh, the two. When we're talking about guardianships and conservatorships for children, uh, we're, we're thinking ahead, uh, you know, at what point uh, might this child not need that anymore? And sometimes they don't, uh, and, and based on how things go. And so we're looking at, we can go back to the court and say, hey, we don't need to do this anymore. It, 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 this is okay now. This child is in a safe environment, and, and we don't need to be the guardian anymore. Also, the thing that you've got to think ahead of is, what happens if you're not here? What happens if something happens to you? Okay. Uh, I say that all the time to, to my daughter. My son-in-law died six, and, six years ago uh, and left a nine-year-old and, and uh, a grieving widow. You know, son-in-laws are down a dozen. I was looking for one when I found him. Um, I used to tell you that all the time uh, because uh, you, know, you don't want son-in-laws to think you think too much of them. <laughs> and uh, uh, so my son was a great guy, crazy about my daughter, and a very loving and good father. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, you're never going to give in to that kind of, of uh, praise to a son-in-law, you know? And I used to say to him, all, but he would call me the lawn jokes. And when he finished the lawn joke, uh, I would say, was that funny? Was that supposed to be funny? And then I would say to him, my son-in-laws are dying a dozen. I was looking for one when I found you, and I'd hang up with you. And he would laugh. He thought it was the funniest thing in the world. And then I get a grandson. This is how God gets even with you. Let me just tell you right now, God gets even with you. Uh, I used to tease him that way all the time. So I get this wonderful, wonderful little grandson. Uh, and I rush to see him. He's two days old. Uh, I, he was sitting in one of these little baby the baby chairs. That's why someone just sent me an email. Okay, I see he's sitting in this little pumpkin seat thing. You know, he's got a blanket over him. I rush in. My daughter's laying on the bed. He's sitting in his little seat on the bed. And I pull the cover back and look at a perfect absolute, complete DNA model of my son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh no. And my daughter said, mom, what is it? And I said, he looks like his daddy. And my son-in-law said, yeah, he does, don't he? <laughs> he is now 15 years old, and he is an exact, absolute model of my son-in-law. Okay? He looks exactly like him. He has my daughter's blue eyes other than that. Uh, you would, and, and the older he gets, the more he looks like him. And every once in a while, I'll say to him, when are you going to quit looking like your daddy? And he just laughs real big, and he says, nah, uh, daddy wants me to look just like you, so it'll bug you. And, and that's our, kind of our relationship uh, that goes on down the road. But think about that, guys. Okay? I have a 15-year-old grandson. I pray for my daughter's health. I tell her every day, I pray for your health. What don't I want to do? Raise a 15-year-old, a 16-year-old, or 17-year-old, okay? or send an 18-year-old to college. Okay? Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to her good health. But what happens? What happens if something happens to her? What happens? Okay? You know, I'm the only grandparent. So, you know, naturally, I think I'm amazing. Uh, my son says, oh, good heavens, Mom, I'd be so much better to take care of him. And, and he has an uncle uh, who might think that he's the one. One thing that you want to be sure that you have done, you want to make sure you've done some estate planning that says, this is the person that I think should take care of my child. Not that the court's going to always listen to what you say, but they're certainly going to be influenced by the fact that you think this is the person who should take care of your child. Uh, my assistant, T, 
is absolutely wonderful. And, and she came into my office one morning and she said, we've had a horrible family tragedy. My brother-in-law's brother in Jacksonville shot his wife and then himself okay, in front of their three children. And here's, here's a terrible tragedy in the family that was magnified then by both grandparents trying to get custody of those three kids. Okay, The father's parents are, are just devastated, but they love their grandchildren and they want them. The mother's parents are angry. Why wouldn't they be? Okay, uh, And they're saying, no way are you going to raise our grandchildren. Okay, and, and, and these people who have lost their son, who's accused of this horrible crime, who love their grandchildren, can just see themselves being cut off from their grandchildren because of this. And so not only is this tragedy tragic, but now it's being magnified by the fact uh, that both families now are fighting, and the children are in the middle. Had there been something in writing, there was absolutely nothing in writing, but had there been something in writing that said, okay, if something happens to us, okay, then we want our next door neighbors to raise our kids because they're the ones that we feel would be the best home for our children. So that's one of the things you need to think of too. Not only guardianship, when your child's alive and well, and you're alive and well, and thinking about the future, but what happens if you're not here? What happens if you're not here? You've got to think about that. And that's a discussion, guys, that husband and wife, mother and father, want to have about their children. You just don't assume, well, you know, my sister's the best one, and, and if anything happened to me, it'd, it'd be my sister. It'd be my sister, and all the time she's thinking, are you kidding? That crazy woman's not going to raise my kid. Okay, so you've got to have some discussion. And one of the things that when we're talking about estate planning and we're talking about children with issues, uh, one of the things that we, we need most of all is open and honest communication. And I say that all the time uh, when I'm counseling families. Let's talk about open and honest communication. Uh, let's talk about how you feel about his sister, okay, about how you feel about her brother. Uh, you know, you want to you wanna say that in a kind and loving way. Uh, you know, you don't want to say something along the lines of, well, uh, we both know how things run in your family. That's not open and honest communication. Maybe honest, but it's not uh, the kind of communication we're looking for. So when we're thinking about guardianships, think not only about when my child turns 18, what am I going to need to do, okay? But think about what happens if I'm not here when my child turns 18. What am I going to do, okay? Plus, you've got to keep in mind that if you're thinking about naming someone as a guardian, let's say your mother uh, as a guardian, mm -hmm. uh, is that person familiar with all of the, 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 the steps necessary and the missteps that can happen when we're talking about SSI uh, and, and the benefits that the child may need? That's crucial, guys, just crucial, uh, that you have someone who knows what you've already learned. And you can't just say, well, I, my mom would be the person, and, and mom hasn't a clue. That's not the person. Sometimes you want to think about co-guardians or co-conservators. Two people. Maybe one who's a professional uh, and one who is a caregiver. Uh, so you might want to think about those kinds of issues. Uh, when you're talking about uh, looking ahead, you want to talk about estate planning. You want to talk about uh, not only who's going to take care of my child, but who's going to take care of the money that we might leave. We have lots and lots of clients who have insurance, primarily for that child who has a problem, uh, it's an issue. And so we're going to leave an insurance policy, and so we want to know uh, who's going to take care of the money. So we have this mistake planning that sets up uh, the, the trail. And so this is where we come and start talking about special needs trust. Because when we're looking at estate planning, we're looking at a couple of different ways to go. Okay? Uh, there's a revocable trust. Uh, there's irrevocable trust, right? So we look at this, every family needs to have a trust of some sort. If you don't do anything, if you don't do any estate planning of any kind, okay, the state has made a will for you. It's called dying intestate uh, without any kind of plan. And so the court says, okay, uh, if you die intestate, that's no will, okay, then we're going to give your assets to your children if you have children. If you have no children, we'll give your assets to your parents. So it's up or down the ladder. And of course, this, this goes on down to grandchildren, and it goes back up here to brothers and sisters, 
okay, and then out to nieces and nephews and on and on. But you have a sick plan, whether you've done anything or not. Okay. Here's the problem. If you have no, no uh, will, nothing at all, and it goes to your children and your child's drawing SSI benefits or Medicaid, okay, and has been drawing that for years, and perhaps Medicaid, the, the state spent a lot of money on them, instead of it going to the child, it is detoured out to repay Medicaid. So here you are for all these years, you've been having your child all these different benefits, and you're very pleased about the benefits because they haven't come out of your pocket uh, directly. It's come out of your pocket indirectly, uh, but not directly. And so uh, you think, okay, well, if something happens to me, and nothing's going to happen to you, keep in mind that I understand just like you do that, that we're the exception to dying. Okay? We're the only ones that are not going to. So, but if you've done absolutely nothing, and it, the, your money that was going to go to your child is now bypassed to repay Medicaid, what's left to take care of the child? Okay. The child's going to spend every penny that you've left before they can get back on the benefits. So if you haven't done any estate planning at all, you have done some estate planning. Okay. So let's go ahead and look at wills. A will is a ticket to probate. And if you don't have any plan at all, it goes through probate because that's how it gets out to your heirs. If you die owning anything, it's yours. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about husband and wife who have everything jointly held. Uh, if he dies, uh, you know, it goes to her. Uh, if she dies, it goes to him. That's joint property. That's not going to go through probate. It's going to go through probate when the second one dies because it has to belong to you when you die. That's the way we get it to the probate court. Okay? So if you have a will, it goes through probate. Okay? And if you say, out to my child, Okay, we've got the same exact issue of Medicaid stepping up. Okay. Now, you can do a trust, it's called a testamentary trust, in your will. So it's not one of those situations where if I make a will, uh, you know, I'm all, I'm all screwed up. You didn't, I'm not saying that. Because you can do a testamentary trust, a special needs trust, that's set out um, in your will. Still has to go through probate. Probate today is about a one year process uh, by the time we get uh, through from beginning to end. It uses up about five to up percent of your estate to pay for the attorneys, the administration cost, and all the other things that go with it, uh, with probate. We avoid probate okay, when we do a, a, a trust. Okay? So we're looking to avoid probate and set up our distribution. So I'm thinking about, okay, here's what I'm going to do, guys. Uh, I'm going to put together a revocable trust, which means I can change my mind anytime I want to, mm -hmm. and change my trust. We do that by amendment. So what we do is we, we create a box for you to put all your stuff in called the revocable trust. So you put your assets in your revocable trust and you say, when something happens to me, then I'm going to create trust for my children. And one of those is a special needs or supplemental needs trust. So I'm going to have a percentage of my estate move out for this child. That's called a third party settled trust. Okay. Mom and dad or grandma and grandpa or aunt and uncle or whoever uh, has left an estate for the child in a, in a trust. Okay. Who's going to be the trustee? That's always a really tough choice uh, because oftentimes what we advise our clients is separate the care from the money. Okay. So well, why would I do that? You do that so they don't uh, buy an escalate to take the kid back and forth to treatment. Okay. My kid, well, the kid really needed to have good transportation. so. Uh, we went and bought an Escalade, uh, so that, yeah. Or, you know, we really need to have a better home uh, for the child to reside in. Uh, so, you know, so what you want to do uh, is you want to name a trustee, okay, who's going to handle the money, and you're going to name a trustee. These are called co-trustee, okay, who's going to take care of the child, the caregiver. So we're almost back to that guardianship and conservatorship mm -hmm. uh, issue again. Uh, and we might here with a trustee, we might have a bank, uh, we might have a trust company, uh, somebody who knows the rules, the SSI rules, who knows what the government benefits are. Um, and, and I'll give you a good example. Some of you may know Rex Kyle, uh, who's the bank of the Ozark. He has a granddaughter who's Down syndrome. And, and so he has educated himself, uh, and he's head of the trust department of the Bank of the Ozarks. And so he's educated himself on what are the availabilities of government help, government assistance, what can she get that will make her life better, that the family can or cannot afford. 
And so uh, he might be, the, the trust department might be the trustee, handling the money, making sure she gets her maximum benefits and all those things, while grandma might be the person who's actually taking care of her, making decisions for her. Um, and so, you know, we can, we can have two <coughs> trustees here. This, of course, doesn't kick in until you, you both pass away. Uh, and then, of course, we have that one thing that, that we have to think about. Uh, you know, who, who is your spouse-in-law? My spouse-in-law. Spouse-in-law. Mm -hmm. spouse mm -hmm. Like my mother-in-law? No, his next wife. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> but she won't be able to play with golf clubs because she's left-handed. Okay. <laughs> the spouse is wrong. Okay. That's when you die, and he or she remarries, uh, and you know, and and she comes to the marriage with her kids, and he comes to the marriage with his kids, and he comes to the marriage with his assets that were your assets. Um, and uh, she comes with her assets. And so now, you know, we've got a, what we call a blended family. Uh, and Melinda Rayleigh, who's one of our attorneys, wrote the chapter in the book on blended families. And she said, everybody in Maumelle is a blended family because it was like the highest demographics in the state uh, for second and third and fourth marriages was Maumelle. And she got a real kick out of that. But uh, it's when there's a second marriage that we have issues because what happens, let's talk about this for a minute. What happens if you die, your spouse remarries, and you have a revocable trust, and your intention was that your money that you and he had earned together mm -hmm. would go to your special needs child? Okay? He remarries, revokes the trust, okay, or you know puts her name on it, and uh, and he dies mm -hmm. first. Then what happens? Goes to her kids, all right, because she can divert the money. I'll give you a really, really good example of what's going on right now in Colorado. I'm barred in Colorado, and I was out there at Christmas time doing a whole bunch of work before the fiscal cliff uh, issue for some very wealthy clients. And I was reading this article in the newspaper, which really got my attention. It's a 17,000 acre ranch, a good portion of which was homesteaded generations ago, talking about helping hands across time. Okay? Mm -hmm. It had moved generationally across family members down to this man. Uh, who had recently died. And he had, he had grown up on the ranch. His children had grown up on the ranch. They're a big working ranch. It has a name, I can never remember the name of Baker Ranch or something like that. And uh, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren this ranch. Their mother, the children's mother, his children's mother, had died uh, fairly young. He had remarried, okay, and a long marriage, wasn't a short marriage. Okay? Uh, and they found out that she had given their 17,000 acre ranch to the state of Colorado when they saw her on TV being congratulated by the governor. Oh, gosh. Dad had added her name to the deed at some point throughout their marriage career. She did not have the same attachment to that ranch that the children and the grandchildren and he had had. And she came to the state of Colorado. Well now there's litigation, okay, which they're not going to win. I can't, mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't foresee how the family will win that. Because if I, the spouse, put my spouse's name on my property that my, my mom and dad gave me, right, and I die, and he puts his spouse's name on that property, your spouse-in-law, okay, all right, and he dies, who does the property all belong to? It's hers. It's hers. Exactly, lock, stock, and barrel. And cows. <laughs> the whole thing. I mean, so, when you're planning, you've got to do some planning that says, my goal, my goal is our child. Now, do we both agree to that? Yes. Okay. Uh, and so we're going to fix this so that when the first spouse dies, this is irrevocable and cannot be changed. Okay. Now, he and she can enjoy it. I'm not saying they can't enjoy it. Okay. Uh, you know, she can have all, she can have all the milk those cows give. I don't guess those cows give milk, but she can have all the steaks those cows produce. Okay. But when... He's gone. It goes on to the family. Okay? All right? And, and, and you've heard stories like this before. This isn't anything new. Uh, there's a farm here in, in Arkansas, a beautiful big old white farmhouse up toward Clinton. Absolutely gorgeous place. Uh, and it had been in their family for years and years and years. Husband remarries to a trophy wife. Uh, you know what a trophy wife is? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And this is the prettiest girl you can buy. And uh, so uh, he marries this pretty young woman who uh, had no children. 
and uh, and he put her name on it, and he subsequently died, and you know she's got the the beautiful white house, uh, and she marries a trophy husband, okay, and she died very quickly, you know shortly thereafter, and he now is living in the house with his current wife, uh, and their children, and the kids, you know they, they drive by and wave at the house, but that's the best they can do. Happens all the time. So the thing that you want to do is to talk about open and honest communication. Talk about what is it that we want to have happen if one of us dies. And then certainly, what do you want to have happen if both of you die? Okay, both of you die. And the one thing that the, the, the courts are very you know, sure about uh, when you don't do any planning at all is that you intended for your children each to get a fair share directly. Okay, no, no trust of any kind. It simply goes out to the pocket of that child. And let's talk about children who have no problems at all, other than just that they're you know, kids. Right? Uh, let's talk about the kid that uh, you know, plays football and, and, and has good grades and, and all that kind of stuff, but who will receive his or her inheritance in Arkansas when they turn 18 or graduate from high school, whichever last occurs. Okay? The, the kid has no problems of any kind other than uh, they're young. All right. We have what we call now starter marriages. Uh, you know, that's the marriage that you do right after high school or in college or right after college. Uh, it's your first, it's your trial marriage. Okay, the first one. Okay, uh, we try out, see if you like it. And uh, and and here's what happens. Right. Uh, you know, he he or she get their money on their 18th birthday or when they graduate from high school, and they get their entire inheritance, the whole thing, all one time. Okay, so let's say they're a, an only child, and they get it all. Well, their friends increase. They get lots more friends. Mm -hmm. If you can you know, buy the round, you get lots more friends. Uh, and uh, so, so you've got lots more friends. And so sometimes you get more girlfriends than you might have had because you have uh, more money. And suddenly you are 19 or 20 or 21, and all you've got left is the Camaro you bought with the money mom and dad left to you. There's no start there. The money didn't go on, it didn't go on. So you've got to think not only about the special needs child, but you've got to think about the other kids as well. Mm -hmm. right, so what am I going to do about the other kids? And, and so you want to add trust for the other kids as well. You don't, you don't necessarily have a special needs trust, okay, because that's for my child who has the special needs, who needs supplemental care. Okay, but I've got these other two kids out here. Uh, you know, this one can't manage money at all, never could manage money. Uh, at all, and sometimes you know you know it from the very beginning. <laughs> it's like don't give that kid money because that kid's not going to have any money uh, at all. And, and this kid's a really you know a, a really good saver. It really takes good care of the money. And you think to yourself, yes, but she's young. She's still very young. What if she marries someone who isn't going to take care of her money? And so you might say, you know what? Until you turn uh, 25 uh, years of age, uh, we're going to have. Uh, a trustee who is not you taking care of your money, and you can have it for health, education, maintenance, and support. What you know, whatever it is you need that mom and dad would have provided had we been here. Okay, uh, this can pay out to you. It can pay out income. It can pay out principal. You get to say how that's going to look. Uh, but we want to have somebody other than you managing it. We might not make that age 30. We might make it 35. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just depends. And we can make it different for different kids. We don't have to have the same state plan. Uh, for every kid, we can write different. Well, these are called subtrust. This is the main trust. These are subtrust, uh, and they're not active during life. But the minute something happens to you, these trusts are already there. They're already written into the document. All they have to do is get an EIN number, employee identification number, tax number, okay, and activate these trusts. So this is like a trap door. Springs open, the money falls out. Okay, the money falls out. The money falls out, and then you get to control it on down the road. Okay, talk about this. Let's say that we have elderly parents. Uh, now, you're in that situation now, maybe a, a, your parents are getting on up in years, and, you're, and, and they're thinking and worrying about nursing home. 92% of us will spend time in a nursing home. 92% of you will spend time in a nursing home. Like dying, I'm not going to do that either. Uh, but that might be from uh, recovering from hip surgery or a knee replacement or whatever. You may go for a short period of time and then you go home. You rehab and you go home. Right? Uh, but we all will spend some time there. 50-something uh, percent, I forget the number, 57 percent of the kids will die in nursing homes. So if you have elderly parents uh, and you're thinking, oh wow, okay, do my parents have enough money to private pay through their lifetime if they're in a nursing home? How do we go about taking care of that? That's when we use irrevocable trust. Uh, and oftentimes we use an irrevocable trust from the beginning 
if we're looking to do some Medicaid planning. Uh, and normally we use those with elderly. Uh, normally if we look at a, at a young family like all of you, we're looking at revocable trust, okay, not irrevocable trust. <coughs> but that kind of gives you an idea as to what estate planning might look like uh, for a family who has a special needs child or a child who is uh, young uh, and not yet ready to manage their own affairs. Now, yes sir. Okay, so I have a son who has autism. Okay. Which will never, you know, we don't know what level he'll be at when he gets that age. But uh, can you, would you establish an a, a revocable trust? Just revocable trust. Irrevocable, because you don't want it to be changed. No, well. but you want to establish an ir uh, uh, irrevocable trust for the two of you, because this is your box, okay? Saying that when something happens to us, the two of us, and that might be, you know, 50 years from now, something happens to us, uh, then this is established for him then, and it is irrevocable. And so if, if it comes down the road where we can, uh, he, he, he becomes functioning and he has a, and we see that he's going to be able to be supporting, uh, self-supporting, then we can, we can change it because it's revocable. Okay. We, can, we can change it because remember, we're still working off the document that we created and we can change it anytime we want to. Okay. One of my adopted grandchildren uh, was adopted from Romania and uh, they now live in Ireland, he and his mother and, and sister. And, uh, and he, has, he was in an, basically in a, a cage, a, a baby bed, until she, had, she got him out at five years of age. He had, uh, and I can't remember if it was attachment disorder or detachment disorder, but uh, he was detached, always detached. Uh, he, he did not, um, it, it, was as if, it was as if he could not love. I, I don't know how to describe it any other way. And uh, he was about uh, six or seven years old, and I got him when he was five, and he, we had uh, a, a park, a uh, mobile home park uh, up at the uh, lake, and we had a park uh, model in the lake, and they were right across the street from us. And, uh, and he used to stay at our house more than he stayed at his house, both he and his sister. And uh, his sister was great. We taught her to work for ABCs, and uh, which we thought was something every young woman should know. And, uh, her mother was very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, straight laced would be a good word, okay? And uh, she didn't think girls should work. But they look at Burke better than anybody in the world, so we thought if anybody could work and hold it that long, she ought to be able to say her ABCs at the same time. And, uh, and, and so Costica thought that was really funny. And he would come over and say, uh, I teach Emma to Burke. And, so, and, and we got very attached to him, and he became attached to us and a dog, finally. But he cannot, uh, in, in Ireland now, he's in a special school. He just now is, is finishing school there. And he will not be able to, to function living alone. Um, and he's done some pretty goofy things, like we had a carload of grandkids one time. We were driving down the street, and Costica opened the door to see the door fall off. And um, unfortunately, they were all belted in. <laughs> but we've had some of those cases, and uh, he set the grass on fire behind our park model uh, to, to see if wet grass would burn. You know, kind of some kind of those kind of things. But it's absolutely adorable, handsome, gypsy kid. He's just really mm -hmm. sweet. Uh, and he's coming to see Grandma in June. And Emma's going to live with us next year and go to school. So I, I don't lose these grandkids. I just, I just move them all over the world. Uh, but uh, here's a kid who will not live alone. He, he will not be able to live on his own. And Ireland has some places where he can live and work. Mm -hmm. You know, he can, he has, a, he'll have a job, and he will be able to live and live quasi independently. Mm -hmm. So I have a little bit of experience with planning for children and thinking about children who have these kinds oh. of issues. Now I'll be in the rehab program right now. Uh, that might be a little bit kind of a different issue, uh, but I have Costica who you know, will not live independently um, the, for his lifetime. He, he will not be able to do that because we, we've tried very hard throughout the years to, to help him develop his independence and that hasn't worked. So we put together a revocable trust for Mars. She's not married, never married, uh, adopted these two kids uh, as a single person. And we put together a revocable trust and Costica, if something happens to Mara, because Mara uh, is, is alone, if something happens, Costica will have a trust that will pay for his care. And even if he lives you know, independent as much as he can, he still has to pay for his care. What if he's not able to work there? Can he uh, still have money? Yes, we've set that up uh, so that he will. Now let's talk about just special needs trust. Uh, and, and we really have three categories. Uh, there's the third party. Uh, trust, okay. Uh, there's this what we call self-settled trust, okay. And then there's the pooled trust, okay. Uh, let's start with the third party settled trust. This is where you, your assets, and, and think about it 
uh, the third party's assets. So this is not the child, this is not their assets. Uh, their assets would be the settlement from a, an automobile accident or the settlement from uh, maybe brain damage when they were born or something like that. That's their money. So this is the child's money. This is mom and dad or grandma and grandpa's money or Aunt Sue's money or uh, whoever's money. Right? And so the, the parent comes to me and says, uh, my child has issues and we talk about those uh, and, and we, we really want to leave that child in a better position than now. And we want to set it up now. We want to set the child's trust up now. Not when we die, but today. Now, we put money in this trust uh, today. Okay. And so uh, we establish a trust for the parent specifically for the child. So this is uh, Sue's trust. So it's not the parent's trust, it's the child's trust today when we set it up. Right? Uh, and so we put this, this trust together. Oftentimes this comes from grandma and grandpa. You know, grandma and grandpa say, mm -hmm. I want to set something up specifically for that child, my grandchild, Sue. And so I want to do it. And, and I don't, it, it's outside of what I'm leaving you two kids. That's, it's outside of that. I want to do something for my grandchild. And so we set up this third party trust, put grandma's assets in it that she's giving to Sue, and we establish it right now. The beauty part about it is there's no payback here to Medicaid. I don't care if this was a million dollars, and Medicaid has spent a million dollars on the child throughout the years. Okay? Grandma dies, this belongs to the child. Plus grandma can say, and if Sue dies, I want it to go to my other two grandchildren, whatever's left. So I provided for Sue's any education, any therapy, uh, anything my grandchild needs. Today, the money's there. Don't you worry about it, son. I've, I've taken care of it. And so it lifts the burden off of the child because grandma, she's made sure that that's done. But if something happens to Sue, her life the expectancy's not as long, and there's going to be money left in that trust, I could send that money out to my son, the parent. I could send it out to both of my children. Uh, I could send it to charity. I can do anything I want to do with it because it's a third party's assets. And therefore, the law can't tell me what I have to do with it. I've taken care of it. Right? Now let's move to self-settled trust. Okay. Uh, self-settled trust is, this is Sue's trust with Sue's assets. So Sue's gotten money from uh, a, a medical malpractice suit, or Sue's gotten money from an automobile settlement, uh, or Sue has an accumulated, let's say that, that we apply for some benefit that's retroactively paid. So I get a hunk of money that comes back to this child. It's the child's money, not grandma's money. Okay? It's the child's money. That's called a self-settled trust. Okay? When it pays out, whatever's left in there goes back to repay Medicaid or any government benefit. So whatever's in there. So I can't take a self-settled trust, put my money in it as the child, okay, and leave it to my parents when I die. I can't do that. Self-settled trust, it, it has, these are called uh, D4A trust, and it has a, a dictate that because it was my money to start with, okay, I cannot then avoid repaying whatever I might have received in government benefits. Self-settled trust. Pool trust, we seldom use pool trust. Uh, pool trust are where you, know, you, you set up a trust and is a nonprofit. The nonprofit manages, invests, and takes care of the money, pays income out to the person, pays whatever might be needed out to the person out of everybody's funds for the most part. Okay? And this can either, depending, can either stay in the pool at death or pay out. It depends on which state, depends on what the rules are. All right. We don't use them very often. Usually the only time we use a pool trust is if there are no beneficiaries left. All right, there's no brothers and sisters, there's no children, uh, there's really nobody to get it. Uh, so family money, it's okay the family money goes to help other people who are similarly situated. And so we would use a pooled trust. Otherwise, we're looking at either, either one of these. Now, the self settled trust can be established by grandma and grandpa. That's, and mom and dad, and that's basically the only uh, people who are allowed to, to do self settled or the person who, who sue the, the person who's doing the trust. But it's not just, an individual is not going to set up a self settled trust. Now let me talk a little bit about getting around some of these rules. Because after all, I'm a lawyer. Okay, so my job sometimes is to find the hole and walk through. Uh, so let's say that we have an automobile accident. 
where someone is going to receive, uh, we had one on about $480,000. Uh, a child had been injured, uh, and so we had money coming. And we had ch other children that mom and dad were very concerned about. Okay, I don't want this money to <coughs> end up going back uh, to Medicaid. I, I really would like for it to be able to come to my children here. So what we did was we went to the court, and we said to the court, okay, court, will you jump in the middle here? between the money coming from the insurance company to this self settled trust, because remember, it belonged to the child, it's coming to the child, it's the child's money, okay. Would you jump in the middle here and order, that's the word, order the insurance company to pay it out to a third party trust? And you say, well, wait a minute, if it belongs to the child, how can it be a third party trust? Because the court, a third party, ordered the money into the trust. And we've done that a number of times and been successful in getting it over into a third party trust, which means when things are done, then it can go to other beneficiaries. Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. On that, when you're saying, say you have a child that's been in a car wreck mm -hmm. and they get 500000 mm -hmm. but then they die. You can get it ordered to go to your uh, other we get, it, we get it ordered to go here at the beginning. Yeah, when this settlement know. happens. Okay, instead of it going in here, which is where normally it would go, okay, we get the court to order it. We don't just ask the court to approve the movement into the trust. The court has to order it. So we put on a petition, and we've done this a bunch of times and been very successful with it. So we've got the 500000 We know that's what we're going to settle for. The lawyer calls you and says, well, guess what? I got, I got them to agree they're going to give you $500,000. And, and, and it's going to pay out to the child. And you say, whoop, 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 wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Oftentimes, if you're talking personal injury lawyers, they don't know about the elder lawyers mm -hmm. stuff. And you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Let's call Mary on the phone and get her to petition the court to order the money into a third-party trust. All right. So even though it's still called the Sue Special Needs Trust, it's not Sue's money. Whose money is it? Well, it apparently was the court's order that put the money there. So when Sue dies, uh, little John and little uh, Mary can get what was left over from there. Okay. Our mom and dad can get what's left over from there. So there are all kinds of things that you need to be looking at when, when you're thinking about what happens when I'm not here. What happens when I'm not here? How do I take care of my family? How do I get my family money and to stay in the family? Which is kind of the whole reason for having family money. Otherwise, why work? You can't uh, have money. So you know, we're looking to try to look ahead. How can I take care of my family in the future? Especially if I have a special needs child. How do I take care of that child so that, that I'm not worrying about it on down the road? I, my mind is at ease now. I've done everything I can do. And so I've made the plan. And when we talk to clients about what's best for your child, what do you want your child to have? I was going through last night doing some final edits on this particular chapter, um, and, and, and I was looking at a list of things that, that I might want to make my money available for my child. Toiletries, okay? a TV, computer. You know, lots of autistic, autistic children today, they're saying computers are just kind of like a, a godsend. Suddenly it opens up their world. Uh, and so, and I don't want them to have just the one we've got now, because the computers, you know, they change. Uh, I hold on to mine as long as I possibly can, because I start all over again. I, don't, I get a new one. It's like a new telephone. It's like, how do you use this? Uh, what is this kind of thing? And so we want the child to be able to progress with whatever they need. And so, you know, if you get a new iPad and it's a, uh, you know, it, it thinks for you, and then I want my child to have that think for you iPad. If I want it. Uh, want them to have a, a TV. If I want them to have games that that you know help them, then then I want them to have that. Whatever is the newest and greatest and best thing for my child, okay? Then I want them to have that. Uh, I want them to have clothes. I want them to have uh, you know shoes. I want them to have uh, whatever it is a, a physical therapy. Uh, whatever it is, what's the, what's the list? I want to make sure that none of that money though is reserved for room and board because if the if they'll pay for room and board, which normally Medicaid will, and then medical expenses, then I don't need to pay for that. I want to pay for everything that my child can't get. 
uh, because of, of the fact that my child is eligible for these things. Let me talk a minute about public policy. Arkansas actually has a law, actually has a law in the books, as do some states, that it is against public policy for us to plan uh, to protect our estates and have the government pay, uh, the public pay, and so it's against public policy. So you say, what? Let me challenge each of you in here to think through this scenario with me. We hear the term entitlement a lot bantered about with our government, entitlements. Um, and of course, I do a lot of Medicaid planning for the elderly, and that comes up on a regular basis. Uh, I had a financial planner in Denver say to me a couple of weeks ago, uh, your clients have plenty of money, and I don't want to pay uh, for your clients' long-term care. Let them pay for their own long-term care. And I said, well, ma'am, uh, I, I don't call that an entitlement. I call long-term care an earned benefit. And he said, what? And I said, well, my two clients have been working since they were in their teens, early teens for him, okay? Uh, and so he's paid into the Social Security system for 60 years, 65 years, as a matter of fact. He's paid, and he's made really good money. So he's paid into uh, the system at the max. So let's look at that just for a minute. And then I want to challenge each of you to think about this uh, when it comes to your own government benefits and your parents, etc. Okay? Let's <coughs> say that John and Sue they started working when John was 13, Sue was 15, and he's mowing yards and he's doing all kinds of things and, and he's actually paying into the system. And so the government sets up an account and they call it the John and Sue account. Okay? And every year, John and Sue pay into it. And let's pretend that the government said, well now, the you know, average return on investment would be 5%. And I know everyone in this room is going, where are you getting 5% today? But remember the Carter years? The people were getting 15%. So, you know, we're kind of averaging it out 5% across the board. Okay? The government has taken John and Sue's money, every penny that John and Sue paid in, follow me here, and they have compounded annually uh, an investment return of 5%. Okay? And let's say that we did this for, eh, let's say, 60 years. So if you computed what John and Sue had put in at 5% over 60 years, they would have an amount. And now, at 65, John and Sue began to withdraw. And they probably will withdraw about $1,000 a month each. So they're going to withdraw $2,000. My question to you is this. Will they ever get their money back? Well, if they don't get their money back, they've already paid for their long-term care, haven't they? They've prepaid for their long-term care, or they have prepaid for their child's care. So how then is it an entitlement? By the way, if anybody's watching this, this is a political statement. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> but tell me, I can't help it that the government didn't keep John and Sue's money separate from everybody else's. I can't help that. That's not my issue. My issue is John and Sue paid into the system for 60 years. At 60 years, had their money been invested at 5%, compounded annually, okay? Then when they began to take out, will they live long enough to take it all out? No. All right. Okay, but let's add one more factor to it. John died. He drew two checks out of Social Security, and he died. You know, men die younger because they're not made out of this good of stuff, and they don't last as long. <laughs> Of course, I had a man say it. I said that one time, the man in the audience said, are you kidding me? We wear out taking care of women. So I have not said that as often. Um, <laughs> but let's say John dies. He gets two social security checks and he dies. All right, what happened to his benefit? Did she get a lump sum of giving her all his money back? No. She might get a bump up and her social security made it to $1,200. Oh, that's right, yeah. Oh. $200. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> My son-in-law died at 50, and, uh, and he had worked since he was 13 or 14 when he started working. And, uh, and, and he worked, he had a pretty good career, made a pretty good bit of money. Uh, and my daughter and grandson are drawing, my grandson quits drawing, though, uh, in the next couple of years. 
And, uh, and my daughter said one time, she said, Mom, I'm drawing every penny because I won't get any more. This is back something like five years or everything he had paid in. So when you think about that, and someone says to you, entitlement, you know, you should, you should, this, you're not entitled. You're, you're, this is an entitlement. This is what the government's going to give you. Your argument has got to be, no, this is what I have purchased from my government. These are my earned benefits. So when you're looking at uh, long-term care, when you're looking at care for your children, when you're looking at, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, Medicaid and, and Medicare and SSI and SSDI, I want you to think in your mind that maybe you have prepaid for this. So when people start saying to you, when are you, when are you trying to get this kid on every government benefit? And the answer to that is yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. How do I keep my child from losing their benefit? You plan. Because if you don't plan and something happens to you and the child gets everything that you, their share, okay, of your estate, then someone else may get it instead of your child. Mm -hmm. One thing for sure is that your child will lose benefits until such time as that money is all gone and then they get the benefit back again. So we've got to be very, very careful that we don't uh, eliminate our children from the benefits that, uh, that they desperately need. A lot of these children need a lot of medical help, you know, physical therapy and, and things that Medicaid is paying for. You don't have enough money that you can leave that'll pay all the medical bills uh, mm -hmm. for some of these children. So you have to be very careful about that. Now, I've talked and talked and talked, and I hope I have taught you something uh, about what uh, uh, you need to know. But now, please, ask, let's ask questions uh, so that I can maybe more <coughs> clearly uh, define some of these uh, topics for you. Come on. I have, I have a couple of So, uh, say Luke, my little boy gets married when he's 21, mm -hmm. but I've died, we've died and we have a guardian. Or I have guardian. No, mm -hmm. say we have guardianship. Okay. Mm -hmm. still. okay. So, if something happened, something happened to you, uh, you know, you can name in yeah. your a statement. But this say we're still alive, uh, but he, okay. he gets married, he's married at 21. Or he doesn't have his money, you've got it, you've got control of everything. But does his wife get any? Well, we try to keep them all out of things because they're not in the family. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so since you've made yourself a guardian, let's say, because yeah. I had the same question. Okay. And he gets married. She can still be. She is still the guardian of him. Is exactly. that right? Yes. Okay. So and she has to give permission for him to marry. Let's start with that. Oh. Okay. okay. She said. Okay. Let's let's look at this. Okay. Let's start with the guardianship. Okay. Remember what we talked about with guardianships. It's the care of the person. Right. All right. And so, I, the mother, am making decisions for his person. That's one of the reasons we want to do this because there are unscrupulous people out there. He gets a check every month for. Mm -hmm. A thousand dollars, okay. And someone says, "I'll marry Tommy because he's getting a check for a thousand dollars, and so I'll have a check for a thousand dollars." And they take it off on him. I mean, I, I see this all the time, okay. I'm a guy right now that's living in a uh, facility up in Jacksonville, and uh, and and his sister who takes care of his money. She's the guardian, uh, and and she was giving him some money each week, about fifty dollars. Well, he would buy cigarettes for him. Then I'm out of smoke in the facility. Uh, but he would go out, some guy would come and get him in the car, and they would ride off to this guy's house. But he was buying cigarettes for everybody, and beer, for everybody, and uh, to the extent of his money. And then he was always telling his sister, and you know, she gave him money on Friday, on Saturday, and money. Well, what'd you do with it? Well, I spent it. Well, what'd you spend it for? I spent it for stuff. And he, he couldn't, well, she began to find out that, you know, this guy's coming and getting, and, you know, they're riding off and spending his, whatever money she was giving him. So those are the kinds of issues that we're working to. But, but you're the guardian. So you get to decide, if you're the guardian and the conservator, I get to decide how much money I'm going to give him, and when I'm going to give him money, and whether or not he can marry. Mm -hmm. Because this may not be, this may be the one who wants to buy, wants to buy cigarettes for him. So you're the one who gets to decide. So that's an issue that we want to address. You're still the guardian. Let's say something happens to you, and you say uh, uh, to both of you, uh, so I'm going to, uh, I was the guardian, and I'm going to now appoint or, or tell the court in my estate plan uh, that I want my sister to be the guardian. So I'm, ref I'm recommending to the court. Well, your son will come into the court and say, uh, I don't like her. I, don't, I, don't, I want to pick my own guardian. Well, the court doesn't really give that much credibility. They look okay. at this person. This person's willing to do it. You have, quote, recommended, because you're not appointing, you're recommending to the court. And the chances are pretty good that they're going to substitute 
thank this person for the party. We had a guy the other day, he's an IQ of 57, and, uh, and, and we went to court and he told the judge, he said, I, he is 52 or 59, I can't remember which, but he said to the judge, Judge, I'm getting smarter. I'm learning stuff, and my sister wants to control me all the time. And she won't give me my money. He's, he's getting money from uh, the Arkansas Teachers Retirement. His mother was a teacher. And I'm not, I, I can't have my money. I want my money. I want my money. And, uh, and the judge said, no, your mother set this up to go to a special needs trust. Your sister is the trustee and the guardian. Uh, and therefore, you have to look to your sister. And, but it was really funny because he said, I'm getting smarter and I can manage my own mind. Uh, and, 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 and cognitively, he, he could not. So what you do is, is you get the guardianship. You are the guardian. You get to make those decisions. Uh, you know, you get to say where he lives. You get to say who, basically, as much as you can, who he associates with, uh, whether or not he would marry. Uh, all the issues that, that a guardian, a parent, think parent, mm -hmm. okay, uh, would continue. You, you are. You're in, still in the parent mode, even as he's an adult, because you're the guardian. Okay. So now, then, uh, I'm sorry. But yeah. Now, I know like a 15-year-old girl, if she has a baby, she yeah. becomes an adult. Mm -hmm. Does your baby's play any role in that? Okay. No. So you'd be the guardian of two things. Yeah. Okay. One. Okay. okay. I was absolutely amazed statistically how many grandparents are raising grandchildren. Yeah. When I was looking at guardianships and all that, and, uh, and I, I get on my knees and pray even harder for my daughter's health uh, when I'm thinking, yeah, it's crazy, I'm thinking you know. uh, So then, in, God forbid that happens, because we have a daughter. Okay. Um, uh, so you want to think about it, but if, if that were to happen, we would, if we had previously a guardianship of her, yes. uh -huh. we would automatically. No, you'd go to the court and we, say, okay. there's a child. Okay. If there's a child. Please add the child. Okay. Um, okay. So because I, I would be concerned about the other grandparents, exactly. the father. Exactly. I've control. I've control. Okay. Okay. It, guys, listen. Let's face it. This is what it's about. Control. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have to control. I'm, I'm not looking because if you don't have control, who does? Somebody has to have control. And if you have a child who, who cognitively or uh, physically cannot take care of themselves, right, then someone has to do that. And it's your responsibility to do that. What, what is difficult is if you let them get beyond 18 and then you come back to the court and say, oh, I, I forgot to get it when he was 17. Mm -hmm. So I'm here asking the court. And he's going, what? What? Wait a minute. You thought I was an adult and okay to take care of myself when I was 18. And now suddenly, you know. And, and we run into that situation quite often. There's a lot of cases on it where the parents manage the child's money mm -hmm. on past. Uh, and these are children, well children. Uh, on past their 18th birthday, just because they always had, all right, and we still think of them as children. Uh, I still think of my adult children as children, all right, you know. And, and, uh, and my son spent the night with me one time, and, and he wasn't in about by, by like midnight. And, and I called him myself and I said, Where are you? And he said, Mom, I'm an adult. I live by myself. Just the fact I'm spending the night with, or the week with you this week doesn't, you know, you, you don't, you don't need to call and find out where I am. I'm like, oh, Okay, Mom. <laughs> I just tell you the, the story that, that uh, I told a lot of mothers with new babies. When my son was born, uh, he had not, at nowhere had they given him his instructions on sleeping through the night. Uh, and uh, every two hours he was awake. And, and I'm a sleeper who, if I, if, I, if I go to sleep and wake up, I'm awake. Okay? And it takes me forever. I mean, we were at the next feeding by the time I was ready to go back to sleep. And so I'm sleep deprived about three weeks into this. And, and, and I mean, I'm just, I could sit, you know, I sat down and I go to sleep. And so my mother came over, the, the proud grandmother, you know, her only child's only child. And, uh, and, and she was just eat up with this little boy. And so she comes in from work one day, and instead of coming to her house, she always came to my house first. And, uh, and so and I lived right next door at that time. So she came over to the house, and, and, I had, and I just put him down, and I had just laid down, and Mom comes in. And I said, Mom. When will I ever get a, a full night's sleep? And my mother said, never again. And I thought, God, God, help me. I never, he's never going to sleep through the night. Is that what you're doing? And my mother said, no, sweetheart. Okay. He will start sleeping through the night. You won't, because you will always listen for him when he lives with you. And if your phone never rings in the night when he doesn't live with you, 
the first thing you will think about when your eyes pop up and you're wide awake is him. And that's true. It's been true. I mean, you know, he's an adult man who lives alone in his own house. <laughs> uh, and I still, if, if the phone rings in the night, instantly I think of my two children, my grandson. Because something happened in my family. And that's what, that's what estate planning is all about. It's, it's what will happen to my family when I'm not able to take care of them anymore. Um, what is the trust when you have life insurance and you want it to go directly for the care of your child's estate? To the trust. To the trust. To the trust. If it goes to if it goes directly to the child, the child loses benefits and may have to repay. So what you do is you simply uh, let's let's say that this is uh, you're, and let's say you don't even have a trust. You don't have a trust, but you have established a trust for Tommy. Okay, and you say, okay, I got life insurance, and the beneficiary of my life insurance is the Tommy Trust. And then I say in the trust what can be used, what that money can be used for. I run into that all the time with, especially with elderly clients who have an adult child that you know they've raised. It's always been with mom and dad, and and now dad has passed away. Mom's living alone, and she doesn't really have very much. I have a, a little lady up in uh, 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 Manette, uh, which is just she has a little house that's probably worth seventy five thousand dollars, maybe paid for. Uh, she really has a little bit of money, but not not much money. But this child is going to live somewhere. She's if the child's 55 or 60, uh, and some mother's going, where will my daughter be? Where will my daughter be? What's going to happen to my daughter? And what we did for her was we bought a life insurance. And so mom has life insurance. It pays to the daughter's trust. There's a trustee. The bank's going to be the trustee. And so the, the bank will manage this bank's $150,000 for this child's benefit on and on and on and on. And, uh, and so the child will be able to live in the home, perhaps with an in-house caregiver, a housekeeper, something like that. Uh, but there's going to be money there. Mom doesn't have money anywhere else. So that life insurance would go directly to the trust, not to the child, directly to the trust. So if you've ever had like, a child that's had any kind of medical benefits from mm -hmm. the government, you don't ever want to establish anything in their name? No. No. You always want to in trust for. In trust for. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because you want to be sure that the money doesn't go bypass mm -hmm. the child and go completely back to repay. Question? Um, I have a question just on getting the guardianship. Okay. Uh, our son's 18 now. Okay. And we tried last year to get a guardianship for him. Okay. But the doctor would not mm -hmm. write the medical note. He said that he was so borderline that we didn't want to take those rights away from him and he would not write the letter. My advice to that is get a different doctor. Yes. <laughs> okay, because you, you, you really have to understand that my opinion as a doctor, and this opinion for a different reason, is important. I'm the parent. I see the actions every day. I'm asking you to write the letter. And if he refuses to write the letter, I get a second opinion. We run into that an awful lot of times with the elderly. You know, mom can't remember where she is, and, and you say, Mom, you really need to think about getting a guardianship, and she goes, no. But there you are, the child, acting now in the, mm -hmm. in the role of parent, and you think, I've got to do what's best for my mother, or my parent. I've got to do what's best, and I can see it coming, you know. And, um, and, and we run into that a lot. With El and, and I would be the same way. I mean, let's come on, let's face it, guys. You know, if one of my kids stepped up and said, "Mom, you know, you're really slipping there," uh, I would be very defensive mm -hmm. of that. Would you, would you not? Mm -hmm. And uh, and but at the same time, you know, if you leave the parents in the home and they kill them, burn themselves up with the you know set the house on fire or or, or or fall and 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 hurt themselves, what's worse, the, the guilt mm -hmm. from that? And and if and if it's not if it's not that bad, and, and you say, okay, I can help mom by getting someone to come in. That that makes a big difference. But if the, if you if you're if you feel as the parent, in my child's best interest, this guardianship is important, I would get a second opinion. I really would. Okay. So will we have a more difficult time now that he's already 18? Based on some well, you know, he can also come to the court and say, wait a minute, I'm perfectly okay. And, and the letter from the doctor, uh, you know, and you can you can argue it. Uh, I've seen it go both ways, which is why I always tell my clients, you want to do this before they're 18, uh, because they they really don't already have the rights that now you're trying to take away mm -hmm. from them. Uh, they never had them to start with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. You had a question. Then can you and 
others may already know the answer, but can you walk us through just the basics of setting up a trust? Oh, yes. I'll be happy to do that. Normally what we do is we ask our clients to make a list of your assets. Okay? Make a list of your assets, make a list of your children's names, full names, and birthdays. Come into the office and sit down together, husband and wife, together, uh, and talk to me very honestly and openly about your family. Okay, I'm not in the business of judging. Okay, if, if, if I wanted to be a judge, if I couldn't make a living, I'd be a judge. Oh God, please don't put that on there. Write, erase that, write real quick. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, I did not say that out loud, did That's I? okay. Okay, but you know, they're recording it. It's okay. Oh. <laughs> but I, I, I don't judge my clients. You know, I'm, I'm not there to judge them. What I'm there to do is to try to help them resolve a need as simply and easily as I can. So you come in with your assets, you come in with your children, and you talk to me about your family. Talk to me about your children. Talk to me honestly about if I wasn't here, if I'm gone tomorrow, okay, I'm going to be like some mango, we're wiped out. How would I want that to look? How would I want that to look? Okay. And so if I, uh, if I put my plan together and I named someone else, uh, my sister to be the trustee, and I named my brother and his wife to take care of my child, the one thing you always want to do, though, is, is ask if that's okay. You want to have a conversation with the... And nothing's more surprising than to wake up one morning and find out you're the parent of a kid that you didn't want. A kid you didn't want. Uh, or maybe you didn't even like. So, you know, but, but you, you start off by saying, okay, these are my assets. Uh, this is what we have, okay? Uh, and this is our beneficiaries. So I'm going to tell you, Mary, that these are the people that I love, and this is what I have accumulated. And, we're going to, and sometimes we talk about uh, how you might improve your state. I'm not a financial planner. Most of my clients are referred to me by financial planners who do a really, really good job. But you know, at your ages, a lot of you can be in, in, in higher risk things as opposed to uh, more safe investments, which is what we see when we get to our clients who are in their 60s and 70s. Okay, but we want to talk about assets. Uh, we want to talk about real estate. And we want to talk about money in the bank. And we want to talk about retirement funds. Right, and so if, if I've got a 401k that's starting and I'm contributing regularly and I think, okay, you know, a good, good man of investment, uh, at some point I'm going to have about X amount of money, so we're looking at that. Uh, and, and not only do I have retirement, but I've got life insurance. And sometimes we have to talk about, do you have enough life insurance? Do we, you know, and here's the thing I run into all the time with uh, financial planners. Okay, is uh, you know this good-looking guy here's got a million two hundred thousand on him. Okay, and this beautiful woman here, he's insured her for eighty thousand. <laughs> Why? She didn't work. She stays home. All right. We did this not long ago where we figured out the worth of a woman. Okay, <laughs> a husband came in almost this scenario. He had a million three on him. He traveled internationally. He was gone a lot. Okay. She was a stay-at-home mother with a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a brand-new baby girl, three little girls. Okay. And he had insured her for 80000 oh. And I said to him, uh, you know, what, what would you do if something happened to your wife? And his response was, I have a million three on me. And I said, but you didn't die. <laughs> she did. <laughs> and he sat there for a minute like he didn't get it. Okay. How much does it cost to buy a new wife? $25 is just the <laughs> How much? <laughs> 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 yeah, the price was, you got, oh, well, here's this guy. I didn't, yeah, I didn't say that, the price was, okay. But listen, here's the thing. You gotta have one that can drive and take the five-year-old to school. While somebody stays home with the brand new baby, Okay, and that's the one that's been up all night, and uh, and the one that's got to make breakfast with the three-year-old. Mm -hmm. Right, so so we're pretty much talking about about two nannies. Full time. Full time. Okay, Boy, he's geez. gone out of the country. Okay, a lot. Mm -hmm. right. we've got to have people staying overnight. So we're probably looking at around the clock care. All right, at that what what at twelve to twenty dollars an hour, mm -hmm. at least. Okay. So the, the, we, I sent them immediately back to their financial plan and jumped all over him. Uh, and, and what they did was they bought a term policy on her because they only need it until, these, until the baby is 18. So we buy a 20-year term, okay, we're, we're filling the, the need there. So we, 
we talk to people about how much insurance have you got? Do we need more if we have a special needs child? What, do we, what would the special needs child need if they lived an average life expand? Okay, so, so what do we need? So you gave me all your assets. Now we're going to talk about your kids. Okay. Oh, yeah, I got one. Um, he's a, uh, he is never going to be able to handle his money. Never. Ever. Not in a lifetime. He's never. You know, he thinks money that grows on the trees and he thinks it all. Um, and so that's the one. And then we've got the one. She's absolutely gorgeous. She'll probably marry six times, you know, the time she's 25. So we want to make sure that you know. And then we've got the special needs child. So we're going to talk about it. The one thing that we run into all the time is just a nightmare. A nightmare is where uh, the parent, and we run this a lot of times with elderly parents, I will leave the money to John, my son, the able son, and he will take care of his little brother. He'll use the money to take care of his little brother. And then I ask the question, what happens if John dies? Where'd that money go? What happens if John gets a divorce and his wife says, well, that's all in our bank account. Okay, well, yeah, but I got that from my mom. And you know, this is to take care of my... Okay, what happens if John never did like his little brother and has resented the fact that you had the kid to start with, that he's, had, he's lost out on all kinds of things because he had to take care of the kid? And he didn't like the kid anyway. So you never do that. You never leave it to one person with the responsibility of taking care of the other one. You do a trust instead. So here we are at that point. And so you've come in to me, and you've got all this information. We've talked about the kids. We know what each kid is like. Okay. And we'll spend about an hour. There's no charge for it. Uh, you can come to Grizz Ferry office there. You can come to Monmouth office there. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk through these issues so that you have in your mind, uh, hopefully when you come in, some ideas on how you want this to do it. I can clarify some of those things for you. So we're looking at, we're going to put your assets in a trust, and we're going to spill out, remember that trap door, we're going to spill out to our children, the special needs child, Okay, uh, the children who are not special needs, their assets. And then every once in a while we'll get the parent who says, well, I want to give it all to this child to make sure this child has enough. And I say, well, wait a minute. Let's think that through a little more thoroughly because we're back to that. I've resented that kid mm -hmm. my whole life and now mom and dad died and left every penny. And, 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 you know, and, and I've had to struggle and I've had to work to... And, and you say, maybe we, can, maybe we can fill this bucket with some insurance so that the other children have their, quote, fair share. So we, we talk about how you feel about that and how they will feel mm -hmm. about that. Very, very important. We had a client come in not long ago, a doctor, a very, very successful doctor who has two sisters who are teachers. And uh, he came in to see me. really very emotional. His parents had not left him anything. They had divided between his two sisters. And he couldn't understand they didn't love me. And I said, wait a minute. I had very voluminous notes in my file. And the parents had said, we educated our son, the doctor. And he has always said, mom and dad, you gave me my education. I don't need anything else from you. Okay. His sisters make $35,000 a year. If they're lucky, he's making a million dollars a year. And they, they talked to me about how wonderful their son was. How, how knew they could always depend on him. And, and all the, and how successful he was. And, and I made really good notes. Now, we always say to our clients, if you're going to do something like this, write a letter telling your kids, well, these people had not. But I had an opportunity to sit and talk to him because they didn't tell him they loved him. They, they just assumed he knew. And they didn't tell him how proud they were of him, that he was making a million dollars a year. And, and he had bought them a car, and he had done all kinds of things for them. And, and his sisters were, you know, just making a living. And, uh, and, and they said, he'll take care of his sisters. We know that he'll do that. He always did it for us. We're so proud of him. But he is making a million dollars a year. His sisters are not. He always said to us, don't worry about me. Don't leave me anything. And he didn't really mean that. Okay? <laughs> right? but, uh, he just wanted to know they loved him. Just wanted to know. And I was able to tell him, yeah, your parents are really proud of you. Look what they said about you. Uh, and all those kinds of things. And those things mean a lot. So if you, if you say, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave 50% here, and I'm going to leave 25 and 25, then tell your children in a letter why you're doing that. Okay, I read a thing in a Reader's Digest not long ago that I get the biggest kick out of because I try to do this with my grandchildren all the time, uh, is tell them they're my favorite. They are my favorite, that kid, okay? And uh, this father has sent a letter. He's dying in a <coughs> few months. He sent a letter to each of his children, and he wrote, and the, and the one daughter was writing this article, and he wrote on the letter, do not open until I pass away. Open only after death. Well, what's the first thing you do when somebody hands you something? That's a Christmas present. Says, Don't open until Christmas. Yeah, open it. Okay, you take it back. Uh, and so she opened it. And he had written 
to her all the things he'd enjoyed about her her whole life and how dear she was to him. And the last line was, and you are my favorite. Okay? And she's going, I knew it! I knew it! <laughs> but that is favorite. Okay, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Okay. And so the four children gather with their parent. And, and it was about our father's humor, is what the, what the article was about. And they gather with their parent at, at, his, at his dime. Uh, and they're laughing and talking and, and about their father's life and with their mother and what a great guy he was and all those kinds of things. And, and they got around to the conversation uh, about uh, getting this letter from their father. Everybody got a letter from their father. Well, it turns out everybody got the letter. And, you know, couldn't wait. Everybody got the letter. And, um, and so they're sitting there and one of the kids says, yeah, so I, I, I have to tell you guys, but I've always known this. I was dad's favorite. And the girl who's writing this goes, no, you weren't. I am Dad's. I don't. But Dad said it in the letter. Well, Dad said it in my letter. Well, as Dad is dying, he has written a letter to his four children, and to each of them he says, "You are my favorite, and you are my favorite." That child. Family story, kind of like that. I have a. I'm an only child. I have a cousin who's an only child. He's six years younger than me. We both stayed. Our parents both worked away, uh, and we both stayed with our grandmother. And, uh, and and I had started, I'd gone on to school at the time. He came along, so he had his time with Grandma before he started school. And uh, he was about four, I would have been about 10. And Grandma and Granddad lived in a big farmhouse, you know, how off the, the uh, ground in the back. And Grandma had her walnuts in the, on the ground drying. And he and I used to play under the edge of the house, under the house, it's our playhouse. And uh, so we're talking about something or other. And anyway, the subject of who Grandmother loved the best came up. He's four, I'm 10. And I said, Grandmother loves me the best. She's always loved me the best. And he hit me in the head with a walnut. And uh, of course, I had called him a baby and some other things before he hit me. But uh, I ran into the tell on him, and he got a spanking and everything went great, because that's the way I knew my grandmother loved me the best. That has continued all through our adult lives. Uh, I have all grandmother's pictures. My mother was the oldest daughter, and she got all grandmother's pictures. And I have them hanging in my lake house in North Carolina. He came in one day, and he said, where'd you get all these pictures? And I said, Grandma gave them to me because I'm her favorite. So of course I got all the family pictures and I have a mug, you know, in the house. And he goes, well, I didn't get any of Grandma and Grandpa's pictures. And I said, that's because you're not her favorite. Boy, well, didn't her favorite. And so this has gone on all through the years of who's, who's favorite. And sometime back I was at uh, Breckenridge at Colorado at my home out there. And I was walking down Main Street and in the window was this little plaque, uh, granite plaque. And it said, God loves everybody, but I'm his favorite. And I sent it to my cousin for his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> it's not only my grandma's favorite, I'm God's favorite too. <laughs> so we want our children to know how much we love them. And one of the things you do when you do estate planning is you let them know, this is how much I love you. I, I'm going to leave you something to take care of you in the future so that you know that I'm going to take care of you. I, I, I took care of you while you're alive. I'm going to take care of you own. And you children are not forgotten. And that's, that's how we do the estate plan. So when you come in to me, to talk to me, you know, have in your mind these issues that you've already discussed. And, and, you know, and I would, if I, if I thought it was in my son's best interest, even now that he's 18, if I thought it was in his best interest to have a guardianship, I would, I would get a doctor who agreed with me. I would get my son to understand why I'm doing this. Uh, and I would go forward with it. Because, uh, you know, we've got case after case after case where mom and dad are still trying to manage his money. And suddenly he says to the court, wait a minute, make them quit. And the courts have said, you quit. Just because you're his parents does not mean that you're able to continue to manage his, his um, assets without the court saying that you should. All right. You had a question back here somewhere? Um, I think I have a question. Um, so once you've established guardianship, is there an expiration date? Mm -hmm. Okay. No. But... My daughter, I, I, I just foresee she's very high functioning. Of course, I don't know what she's going to be like at 18 or yeah. older. But um, at, at any point, can she come back and challenge mm -hmm. that? Okay. Oh, yeah, she can come back and challenge it. Okay. Uh, and, and she can come back with her letter from the doctor right. who says, okay. uh, you know, and, and she can say to the court, I'm working, I'm married, have children of my own, you know, I, I have some issues, but I'm able to work through them. Okay. Please cancel the guardianship. Okay. And, and we did one for the, the fellow I told you about. His granddaughter had the brain damage. Uh, he almost died, and, and his son, he had rental property. And so he's in the hospital on and on and on and on, and then he's having issues himself. And we did a guardianship for him 
uh, during that period of time so the son could go get the money to, to rent, pay his bills, take all, all the things he needed to take care of. And when he was able, it, which took about a year, mm -hmm. uh, we came back to the court and said, he's finally pleased to solve the guardianship. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did a final accounting and closed it out. So, you know, you could, there, there's all, there's answers out there for all of these things you know, when you ask the right attorneys. Uh, you know, your guy who does uh, traffic on Monday and, and something else on Tuesday is not going to have an answer. Uh, but an elder law attorney who does this all the time will have an answer. Okay. All right. I have another question. Kind of a uh, blended family thing. Uh -huh. But um, right now we, we do have a trust and will and stuff. Okay. But we didn't get it by an elder. So we, could, we, pro we probably need to have it looked at. So, uh, so I have a friend that I have asked to be our guardian. Okay. And, that, and she's agreed? He's agreed? Yeah. Okay. Um, but, That's very important. Um, <laughs> but we have we have uh, I have a stepdaughter that's 21. Okay. Um. So how does that play into it? If she wanted to do it, even though we wrote it, and like you know, if we died in five years or something, yeah. and um, what if um, Luke's younger sisters have to be a that are uh, yeah, what if when they get older. All the same time? Yeah. What if they want to <laughs> be his yes, well, yeah. yeah, what if they want to be his guardian and not my friend anyway? Okay. All right. Here here's the way that looks. Okay, so I'm, I'm in a trust, so I have named, okay, a guardian and we we ordinarily say name a guardian and a trustee who's different. So that I've got somebody managing the money, somebody managing the money. <coughs> and so this is going along great, right? the child becomes is highly higher functioning, is doing really well. Uh, and and there, number one, it may not be a need for, but this person may get tired too. Because they don't want to do that anymore. And but you say <coughs> in your writing, this one first, and then this one, okay. And and if we had one that we would not recommend, not mm. recommend, but who might step forward and want to be, we tell the court in the document why not. Why not? Okay. You know, Uncle John's a pedophile. He'll be want to be the guardian, and we'd prefer that not to be. <laughs> and so you, you lay these things out for the court, because I'm not here anymore. I can't speak now. So I have spoken to you, court, in writing. And as I said before, the court always looks at the present situation. Where are we now? But the court certainly going to say, wait a minute. These parents were really, really concerned about this. And they have named, you know, they've gone down the list as to who they think would be sufficient. Now, the younger ones coming up, uh, you know, may have a really good relationship with it and may be the perfect one. But that's what you go back to the court and say, let me do it instead of. And you're not going to know because you're not going to be here. Yeah, no, I'm trying to think that. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't matter. When my, when my grandson was, uh, <laughs> my grandson's father died, uh, Nash was having some real difficulties as a nine year old. Uh, you know, he went to school one morning, came home, his dad was gone. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he was having some real difficulties. And Children's Hospital had a wonderful grief program. Mm -hmm. and, and they, Robin and Nash went over and over, and we went uh, to the grief program and, and participated. And, uh, and he, about nine months after his daddy died, he still had really, I mean, he was still having some real issues. And, uh, and, he, and they gave him a book, which was a picture book, a little kid's book, mm -hmm. uh, about, uh, I don't remember the name of it, but the story goes something like this. Uh, it's about water bugs, and water bugs metamorph into dragonflies, and, and the little water bugs are laying around in the water, and they realize, you know, Susie, where's Susie go? Well, have you seen Tommy lately? Have you seen John lately? And they're asking themselves, where are the other, where the water bugs go? And they make a pact among this little group that wherever they go, they will come back and tell the other ones where the water bugs go, okay? And so he, he goes to sleep, he wakes up, and he's a beautiful dragonfly flying over the water, and, uh, you know, it's a beautiful day, and the sun's shining, everything's going great, and he looks down, and he recognizes his little buddies, and he remembers the pact. Oh, I'm to go back and tell them. And then he realizes, I can't go back, but I can see them, and I always know how they are, and I always know they're well, and everything is wonderful in their world. And they will, they will come to me, though I can't go to them. Solve the whole thing for Nash. Okay, to this day, my grandson sincerely believes his father is watching everything, and we talk about it in present tense. <laughs> uh, I have to remember that, uh, you know, because when he got his learner's permit to drive, I made some comment about, well, your daddy'd sure, uh, you know, be happy to hear that you've got your drive. And he said, he knows. And he's totally at peace with that. Totally at peace with that. Daddy's here. I just don't see it. But he's here. Okay. 
So, you know, the fact that you're trying to see ahead, how will it be? Um, it will be okay. How often should you modify? I mean, like you should you look at it every year. Yeah. Every year. I tell my clients all the time, pick a day. Our anniversary, our birthday, my birthday. I always do mine on New Year's Day because there's football all day. Uh, you sit <laughs> down and look at your trust documents. Look at everything. Make sure that it's it's still the way you want it. Because if a revocable trust, you can change it. Okay? And, you, and that's where you want to be. Remember, revocable while we're alive. Irrevocable after we're gone because we're not there to change it okay so make sure see we do an awful lot of irrevocable trusts that are irrevocable immediately for the elderly looking ahead to a nursing home all right but normally for couples like you we would do an irrevocable a revocable trust that becomes irrevocable after you die so he can't change it with his next wife okay and anybody that had triplets don't want to be married again anyway no. the only thing worse than that was uh, Vic Snyder and his wife who had four under two yeah I know them yeah <laughs> oh yeah. And he's like 65. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. It's a good thing you found out what caused you. Yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you a really funny story about Penn, his, his, their, their, their oldest one. Vic didn't put him down. I mean like, you know, Penn was born, Vic caught him and had put him, didn't put him down. And, uh, and, he, and he wouldn't let him go to the nursery at church because that's when Betsy was at church. Uh, I went to Quapa. And uh, my daughter ran the nursery and she was wanting to get her hands on, on the baby. And he wouldn't put the baby in the nursery, which I didn't think looked that good for the preacher not to put their kid in the nursery. You know, like, oh boy, the nursery over there. And uh, so uh, he would hold, he would hold him, hold him all the time. I'm a grandmother for God's sake. I want to hold him. And so we women would gather around and try to get him when well, he let us look at him, but he wouldn't let us hold him. So we were in a fundraiser at church, and so I said, I'll put a hundred dollars in the plate if I can hold Pan. <laughs> and so we made arrangements. For me to hold him, okay, and this is the absolute truth. When I tell you, Vic had me sit down, oh my gosh. okay, on the pew next to him, and he sat there, and he put Pen over here. I put my arms around him, and I realized I'm holding Vic. Turn <laughs> <laughs> the baby loose, Vic, and and he took the baby back. And I said that was not worth a hundred dollars. <laughs> so uh, I was on trustees when, when uh, Betsy, when we went, Betsy's always high energy, and I went to a meeting and, and Betsy was kind of low energy, and I mentioned to one of the other trustees, she left the room, I said, well, what's wrong with Betsy? I said, boy, she's really low energy today. When she came back and sat down, she said, oh, I've got to tell you guys something. I'm pregnant with twins. And we're going, yay, yay, oh, when she's got twins. Said, oh, God, that's still 300. Two. Well, one of those twins split and became three. Okay, and now she had three. Uh, and pen. And you know what I thought to myself? I thought, hold all four of them, Vic. You see you do that, buddy. <laughs> I guess my gosh, I get the whole babies now. Yeah. You know, and, uh, but uh, they're great. They're they're really, really great. But I was tell you I three under three under uh, three under new ones I I just can't imagine. I mean I have, did you ever have you slept any? Yeah? Yeah. Now, but not all night. Sleep until about five. Oh gosh, gosh. Yeah, you know, I see you have my deepest and most sincere sympathy. But you're you're all right. Oh yeah, my mother was right. Yes, I tell I new mothers when I when they talk to me about they can't sleep and they sit there. I was laughing about it. It's like eh, sleeping's over because that was true. <laughs> Any other questions at all? Thank you all for your attention. Attention, I really appreciate it. Anything else I can answer? Come see me. You know that cost you anything. <laughs> And uh, we'll have a good time talking about babies. Is it a big deal like, to change your whole thing? Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can go by a minute if you have a revocable dress. Yeah. So, not hard at all. All right, have a great day, guys.